Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Carla Faye Tucker? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So first, I'll look at the background of Carla Faye Tucker. I'll move to the timeline of the crime, and then I'll offer my analysis. Carla Faye Tucker was born in Houston, Texas, on November 18, 1959. Her father, Larry, was a longshoreman, and her mother, Carolyn, was a stay-at-home mom. She would later come to believe that her real father was somebody with whom Carolyn had an extramarital affair. Tucker was the youngest of three sisters. At age 8, Tucker started smoking cannabis and cigarettes. At age 10, she was using heroin. Her parents would get divorced around the same time. At age 12, she became sexually active. At age 14, she dropped out of the 7th grade so that she could travel with her mother. Both Tucker and her mother became prostitutes while traveling as groupies with a number of bands, including the Eagles. At age 16, Tucker married, but that marriage would end several years later. When Tucker was 20, her mother died of a drug-related cause. She would eventually become friends with a number of bikers and was introduced to a man named Jerry Dean and his wife, Sean Dean. This couple would introduce Tucker to a man named Daniel Ryan Garrett. He was 35 when Tucker was 21. This takes us to the timeline of the crime. At this point, Garrett is 37 and Tucker is 23. On June 13, 1983, at 3 a.m. in Houston, Texas, Tucker and Garrett burglarized Jerry Dean's apartment as Dean was sleeping in that apartment. Tucker and Garrett were able to get into the apartment because Tucker had stolen the keys from Sean Dean, who had just broken up with Jerry Dean. Not long before the burglary, Tucker and Garrett had been partying. They were both intoxicated on a number of substances, including alcohol, heroin, cannabis, methadone, dilaudid, percodan, and a type of methamphetamine referred to as speed. They wanted to steal a motorcycle that Dean was restoring in his apartment. While committing the burglary, the pair entered Dean's bedroom, and Tucker sat on him. Dean grabbed Tucker to defend himself, and Garrett struck him in the back of a head with a ball-peen hammer. The ball-peen hammer had been in that same room. Garrett left the room for a few minutes to steal some motorcycle parts. Tucker remained in the room. Dean was severely injured, but not dead. He was making a gurgling sound. This bothered Tucker. She didn't like that noise. So she picked up a pickaxe that was also in the room and started striking Dean repeatedly. Garrett came back in the room and joined in the attack, and he is the one who delivered the final blow that would kill Dean. Garrett went back to stealing parts, and once again, Tucker remained in the room. Tucker then noticed that there was another person in the room with her. Deborah Ruth Thornton had been hiding under sheets that were up against the wall. Thornton had been in an argument with her husband. She went to a party and decided to spend the night with Dean. Tucker attacked Thornton with the pickaxe, but Garrett came back into the room and separated the pair. Tucker then continued to attack Thornton with the pickaxe and ultimately killed Thornton. She left the pickaxe in her body. A friend of Tucker and Garrett had been waiting outside. He had come into the apartment at some point, but then he left. He was convicted in connection with his behavior, but not for the murder. Tucker and Garrett left the apartment. The bodies of the two victims would be discovered by one of Dean's co-workers the next morning. Tucker and Garrett were arrested five weeks later after a friend of theirs helped the police tape a conversation during which the pair confessed. Initially, Tucker was charged with murdering both Dean and Thornton, but the prosecutors would drop the charges related to Thornton after Tucker testified against Garrett at his trial. In Tucker's murder trial, her defense called no witnesses which represented an unusual interpretation of the phrase vigorous defense. The jury only deliberated for 70 minutes before convicting Tucker of murder. Not long after she was convicted, she would be sentenced to death. Garrett was convicted and sentenced to death as well. He had liver disease and was treated in prison so he could live long enough for the state to kill him. So it was like a competition between the liver disease and the state to see who could kill Garrett first. Liver disease would win in 1993. While in prison, Tucker started reading a Bible that she was given by a prison ministry program. 
She would say that at first she didn't know what she was reading, but then she found herself on her knees on the floor of her cell asking God to forgive her. She became a Christian in October of 1983. She married a prison minister named Dana Brown. Tucker appealed her sentence saying that she was on drugs when she murdered the victims. She never would have committed the murder without the drugs. She claimed that she was now reformed. Many people started to support Tucker in her efforts to avoid execution. Just to name a few, Pope John Paul II, Pat Robertson, Newt Gingrich, who was Speaker of the House at that time, Thornton's brother, Ronald Carson, and even the warden of the prison, who said that Tucker had likely been reformed after 14 years on death row. Her appeal to remain alive was rejected. On February 2, 1998, Tucker was transported by airplane from the Mountain View unit, where she had been imprisoned, to the Huntsville unit in preparation for her execution. She was allowed to select some of the people who were permitted to watch the execution. She chose her husband, one of her sisters, a friend, and Ronald Carson. Again, he was Thornton's brother. Other people, of course, were there to watch as well, including her lawyer, the warden, and Thornton's husband. Then Texas Governor George W. Bush refused to issue a 30-day reprieve. This was his only independent power. He couldn't actually prevent her execution indefinitely, but he was not even willing to use this limited power. On February 3, 1998, the next day, the execution was ready to proceed. Tucker was asked if she had any last words. She said, yes, sir, I would like to say to all of you, the Thornton family and Jerry Dean's family, that I am sorry. I hope God will forgive you and give you peace with this. She told everybody that she loved them. She thanked the warden. She said she was going to be face-to-face -face with Jesus now. She would conclude by saying, I will see you all when you get there. I will wait for you. After this, 38-year-old Carla Faye Tucker was executed by lethal injection. She was pronounced dead at 6.45 p.m. Now moving to my analysis. Even though Tucker did not have any criminal history, it did appear as though she committed several crimes and was never held accountable. For example, she had a long history of drug use, and she had been involved in a previous altercation with Dean where she punched him in the face when he was wearing glasses. He had to go to the hospital and have glass removed from his eye. The nature of the homicides was, of course, heinous, and other information about the crime did not help her case either. For example, two weeks prior to the murder, she talked about killing Dean because he had defaced photographs of her mother and parked a motorcycle in her apartment. The motorcycle leaked oil onto the floor. After the murder, she would claim that she had multiple orgasms with each blow of the pickaxe when killing Dean and Thornton. Tucker never denied committing the murders, so her actual guilt was never in question. Tucker also had discussions about killing various illegal drug lab managers. This made it seem as though she was only at the beginning of her homicidal career. As far as mental health, there's not really much information available here. Again, no witnesses were called at her trial. A mental health professional was called for the penalty phase, but didn't have a lot to say. The clinician reported what Tucker had told her about the drug use and her childhood. The clinician would also say that it's unlikely Tucker received any sexual gratification from committing the murders or from anything that happened in her life. So she never had that. Some people thought this was a dig at Tucker's past lovers. I don't think that's what was intended here. I think the mental health professional was just trying to make her point. As far as personality, it's not clear if we're seeing Tucker's real personality after she was in prison. Maybe this was an act. Again, there's really no way to know. She claimed that her life had been a succession of last minute decisions, all of which were made without fear of consequences. She described herself as crazy, violent, bad, and rotten. It seems reasonable to believe that Tucker was low in conscientiousness, low in agreeableness, and high in neuroticism. But it's hard to know what her level of openness to experience would be or her level of extroversion. This case drew attention mostly because of Tucker's execution rather than the actual crimes that were committed. It reignited the debate over the death penalty. Many death penalty proponents had the view that if a man could be executed for a homicide, than a woman could be as well. They were thinking that fair is fair. They were surprised that this case was getting so much attention.
they view this case as exposing sexism in the sense that so many people were against Tucker's execution, but those same people really didn't say a lot when men were executed. I think this case highlights how people form and maintain beliefs. Sometimes it's really just a matter of focus. For instance, if somebody focuses on the terror experienced by Garrett and Thornton, if one can empathize with them, Tucker's execution seems to make sense. If one focuses their empathy on Tucker, obviously the death penalty does not seem to make sense. The reality is that it's hard to kill people who are perceived as nice and defenseless. Tucker did not seem like an ongoing threat, whereas some people might look at a male convicted murderer, like Ronnie Lee Gardner, for example, and think this guy is going to offend again because he's inherently dangerous. Also in the area of fairness, this case exposes how the process for deciding who is executed and who is not seems to be based on fantasy and emotion rather than logic and reason. The reasons that people give for and against the execution of a specific person are all based on subjective observations or factors that may or may not have contributed to the crime. For example, how attractive someone is, how sorry they are, if drugs were involved or not, if they had a rough or easy childhood, whether they were rehabilitated in prison or not, did they adopt a religious belief? For example, Tucker became a Christian. Other convicted murderers started worshiping Satan. Should one belief system be considered more consistent with not being executed? My personal opinion is that the death penalty cannot be applied fairly. That's one reason why I'm opposed to it. In the case of Tucker, there were many reasons in favor of her not being executed outside of the fact that she was a woman and she used drugs. The fact that she was pushed into prostitution indicates a traumatic history. That should have been a key point in her defense. But at the time when she was executed, there was not a lot of sympathy for people with that history. If her case had occurred more recently, she may have had a better chance of avoiding the death penalty. The fact of the matter is that for any person who is executed, the experiences in their childhood can be used as a defense. Whether it's drug use, bullying, parents who argued, poor education, poor socialization, or a number of other factors, there's always a factor that can introduce doubt. People are too complex to just say this person should live and this person should die. The reality is that life in prison without parole is the same thing as the death penalty. It just takes longer. It's like the extended version. Furthermore, life in prison is no vacation. It's a horrible sentence for a horrible crime. So we have this fairly devastating sentence, and then there's this argument whether there should be the death penalty. It just seems like they both do the same thing. At some point, I think it makes sense that life in prison is sufficient. But again, that's just my opinion. I would appreciate if you would put your opinions in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.